and welcome back to Franklin Covey's weekly podcast on leadership with Scott Miller. That's me. I'm your host and interviewer each week. I have the enormous privilege now entering into our five and a half years, hundreds of episodes of interviewing and having really great conversations with people from all walks of life. Some weeks it's uh, best-selling authors, business titans, CEOs, board members. Other weeks it is celebrities, uh, athletes, artists, creators. Sometimes it's people that have suffered and recovered from unspeakable traumas and dramas in their life. Sometimes it's not people with a household name, but people that have done some research or done some hard work to develop something that helps you to improve your own leadership skills. This is now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast. Not everybody, however, is always a formal leader inside their organization. Perhaps they are an entrepreneur or a solopreneur or an intrapreneur. Perhaps you have a side hustle. Maybe you just want to become a better leader in your personal life as a spouse or partner or son-in-law, mother-in-law, or to your children or to your siblings. The point is this podcast every week is meant to take the wisdom, the genius, the expertise, the experience of our guests with me peppering in hopefully a couple of relevant questions and bring those insights to you, which is why I've been privileged to write books about this podcast called the Master Mentor Series. 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, Volume 1, Volume 2, out now in print, digital audio, and video from Lit Video Books, where each year, with HarperCollins, I write a book about this podcast. I pick 30 people that I think had a transformative insight, and with their permission, and that usually of their attorney and their publicist and their publisher and everybody else in their life, I write a, one insight about them and publish, publish them in the book, 10 years and 10 volumes. The third volume comes out this fall. Our guest today is a famous author, speaker, coach, leader. You know him also as a patriot to our country and to the world. His name is Admiral William McRaven. He's prolifically written numerous books, including The Hero Code, Make Your Bed, and the new book just releasing now called The Wisdom of the Bullfrog. Admiral McRaven, welcome to On Leadership. Hey, thanks, Scott. Great to be with you. Such an, uh, an, an honor to have you here, sir. Your, your, uh, your history, your selfless service, that of you and your wife and family to our nation is, is um, eclipsed by few. I believe 37 years dedicated to our nation in service of democracy and the freedom that our allies enjoy because of our strong commitment to the principles of democracy. This is a leadership podcast. This is a global podcast. We're based here in Salt Lake City, but I do have a fondness for occasionally spotlighting people like you that have dedicated their entire careers at great risk to their family and to their own perhaps income and fame to put their life on the line as you have and millions of others. So first, as a collective thank you to the 300 plus million Americans that are able to sit at their dinner table tonight and not fear for their survival, thank you for your selfless service and that of your wife and your family as well. I mean that with the most sincerity. Um, thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Scott. I wonder, uh, Admiral, could you rewind a little bit? And for those who may not know the trajectory of your military career, we'll get to the, the role you play as an author and leadership guide now in a few moments. Would you give some of the highlights, including the culmination of your role with um, the operation that took down perhaps the most notorious terrorist in the world. Would you just maybe check your humility for a few minutes and talk about some of the highlights in your 37-year service to our country? Yeah, well, th again, thanks very much, uh, Scott, for having me on today. So, you know, for me, I was raised in a military family. Uh, my father was a World War II fighter pilot, uh, World War II, a little time in Korea. He retired in 1967 out of Lackland Air Force Base, but Growing up in a military family, I was always inspired uh, by the men and women that ha had served during that era. And frankly, I, I love the camaraderie. You know, I like the sense of adventure. Uh, I like their patriotism. So frankly, it was a little bit of a natural trajectory for me to go from where I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, uh, to the University of Texas uh, here in Austin. And I went through the ROTC program there for four years, and then immediately upon the uh, graduation and commissioning. I went to basic underwater demolition SEAL training. Uh, we refer to it as BUDS uh, out in Coronado, California. Uh, got through uh, through BUDS, uh, 
got my SEAL Trident in Underwater Demolition Team 11. That was the first uh, team I was in. And nearly for the next 37 years, uh, spent my entire career as uh, you know, a Navy SEAL in the, in the special operations community. And, you know, as I look back on that, uh, that career, people ask me a lot of times, well, you know, what, what was the, uh, the single mission that, uh, that you thought was the most significant? And of course, they always assume it's the bin Laden raid or the, the rescue of Captain Phillips or the capture of, of Saddam Hussein. But candidly, uh, it really wasn't any single one of those. It was the totality of the operations uh, and the people I spent them with. You mentioned Stan McChrystal before we came on uh, to, to this podcast. And Stan McChrystal used to say something to the, the soldiers that worked for him. He said, look, you may not remember the mission that you went on, but you're going to remember the people you did it with. And I think Stan was absolutely right. You know, it was the, the honor of spending time with these incredible soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and... Uh, you know, the, the great uh, folks in the intelligence service and the law enforcement service. So all of this was remarkable. Of course, it did culminate in the, in the mission to get bin Laden. And I'm happy to go into that as, as much detail as you would like. But once again, I think this mission really just kind of highlighted the incredible quality of, of the not just the special operations community, but all of those that served post 9-11 and before that time. Admiral, you can tell from the set behind me that I'm a prolific reader, typically of nonfiction, business, leadership, culture, marketing, innovation kind of books. Uh, it's rare that I would read a book like this, but I happened to read, I think it was Chris Wallace's book that helped to recreate the um, Bin Laden raid. It was a rare read for me. To what extent do you think Chris captured that right? Well, I know Chris had the opportunity to interview a lot of people that were part of the mission, to include the president. He obviously spent some time interviewing me. So I think he got it, uh, you know, about as right uh, as it can be gotten. Now, the fact of the matter is, you know, every year as, as time passes, and interestingly enough, as more of the information becomes public knowledge, you actually get more insight into the mission than if you'd have written the book immediately after the raid. Yeah. Immediately after the raid, there were a lot of people that were a little bit reluctant to talk. Uh, over time, of course, again, that has opened up as uh, the classification guidance has, has uh, allowed us to speak more freely. Um, and so I think Chris got it pretty right. Uh, Admiral, a mutual friend of yours and mine is General Stanley McChrystal. He's been on our podcast several times, and he said something profound the last time that he was here that stuck with me, and I want you to weigh in on it. He, we were talking about leadership competencies and communicating as leaders, and he mentioned that as a leader, specifically a military leader, you rarely get credit for what goes right, but man, you own what goes wrong. And everybody learns when the mission goes wrong or you lose a troop or uh, something happens. Uh, maybe you could opine or expand on that by reminding the millions of listeners that are listening and watching to this discussion today, this principle of that you own what goes right, but you own what goes wrong, and most people don't see all the things that go right. Because sometimes the things that go right aren't public. They're private. They're decisions that are happening in private. Perhaps it's a termination of a sensitive employee, or it's a handling of a litigation. Or in your world, it's, you know, perhaps it's something that goes right, but you want to keep it private for, you know, global stability. Uh, riff on that. Yeah, I think it's actually I think it's actually more about just leadership in general, Scott. So when you think about servant leadership, and let me take you back a little bit to when I came into the military again in 1977 is when I got commissioned. And, and back in the day, um, it it really was more about uh, putting the young officers and the enlisted men and women in a crucible, pressurizing them as much as you could. And if they came out of the crucible OK, then they were probably going to be good leaders. Uh, I'm not sure that was the right formula. And, and what you found, particularly in the Navy, was a lot of the Navy leadership, uh, they were very hard on their sailors, uh, and they felt they had to be. And again, you do need to be hard when the time is right. But really, in about the, in the mid-80s, we began to, to really accept this idea of servant leadership. And the idea being, look, as a leader, your responsibility was to make sure that the men and women that work for you had the tools they needed to do the job, had the training they needed to do the job, had the latitude to do the job, and then you as a leader held them accountable when doing the job, and you held yourself accountable. To Stan's point, though, also as a leader, 
you always recognize it's not about you. If you ever think as a leader that it's about you, you're probably the wrong person for the job. It is about the team. And that sometimes that comes across as sounding a little trite or a little maybe self-serving or a little false humility. But the reality of the matter is you don't get anything done without the team. We're called the SEAL teams for a reason, because we know you can't get the job done unless the whole team does it together. And so when you're looking for, hey, when things go right, you better make doggone certain that the people that got it to go right are recognized appropriately. And when things go wrong, that is your responsibility as a leader. You are ultimately the man or the woman that had to make the decision, and therefore the responsibility is yours. So you need to accept that responsibility solely as yours. And again, give the credit to the troops when they do things right, accept the responsibility for the failure when things go wrong. And Admiral, you actually share many of those insights in the book that perhaps, you know, projected you on the world as a famous author. This book that was a number one New York Times bestseller, Make Your Bed. Let's take a minute or two and talk about why did that book do so well? I mean, who would have thought a book from a retired admiral, no offense, all, dis all respect, called no, Make Your Bed? It. I mean, this is, this is not a profound idea. Although it is, because you actually had a number one New York Times bestseller. Talk about the premise behind the concept of Make Your Bed. Yeah, you know, so of course it, it comes from my 2014 commencement address at the University of Texas, yeah. uh, where I, I took the time to kind of lay out the, the 10 lessons I learned from going through Navy SEAL training. Um, and as I wrote the speech, um, I did kind of put it in chronological order. In other words, the first thing we had to do every morning was get up and make our bed. But I also realized that the power of telling the young students why that was important uh, was, to your point, it's not profound. It's not hard. It's something every person can do. They can get up in the morning and they can make their bed. And what I found, as I conveyed to the students, was that over you know, 37 years of doing this in the military, making your bed, if you got up in the morning and you made your bed and you took a little pride in it, it would inspire you to do another task and another and another. And the other thing about it was, of course, it was recognizing that the simple things and the little things matter. As one of my SEAL instructors told me, look, if you can't even make your bed to exacting standards, how are we ever going to trust you to lead a complex SEAL mission? Learn to do the little things right and you'll learn to do the big things right. And so that was the, the basis of why I thought it was important to make your bed. Easy to do, reinforces the fact that, look, start off, do the little things right, and the big things will come of their own accord. Reminds me of some of the uh, homespun folklore we heard from John Wooden, the famous basketball coach, you know, taking his teammates through the very meticulous aspect of lacing up their shoes before they ever right. went onto the court. Uh, these principles are universal. Uh, you wrote another book called The Hero Code. It's actually on the wall behind me in a, a place of prominence. Talk about the big idea from The Hero Code. Yeah, the, the big idea from The Hero Code was the fact that uh, we, we can all really be heroes. Uh, you know, when I first started to write the book, interestingly enough, the first thing I had to decide was, well, what is a hero? Uh, I mean, you know, we, we toss that term around pretty liberally. And so, frankly, I struggled for a couple of weeks thinking, well, what is a hero? And then I thought, well, you know, I was a journalism major. Maybe I should go to the dictionary and see what the dictionary says. And interestingly enough, the dictionary, I thought, had a, had a great uh, definition for a hero. It's someone we admire for their noble qualities, their noble qualities. And so as I began to think about who were the people that I admired and what were their noble qualities, I realized that not all of them were these you know, giants of the military or giants of higher education or healthcare? Sometimes, and in fact, most of the time, they were average people that all of a sudden, at critical moments in their life, they had these noble qualities that came through. And the, the message to the reader was, you can learn these noble qualities. You can watch people that are courageous and learn how to be courageous. You can see humility and understand that you can be humble too. You can understand what forgiveness is all about, and you can try to forgive as well. Because if you do these things, you'll be a hero in someone's mind. Admiral, you've had an undisputably storied career in terms of your uh, status as an admiral, 
your contribution to uh, the armed forces in America, your best-selling author status. Your name has been bantered around many times as candidates for National Security Advisor, Secretary of Defense. Many people have called to have you even consider running for the U.S. presidency. No question, you're qualified. And to complement all those, you earned a special designation known as the Bullfrog. And that may not be common knowledge to everyone, but this is, in fact, the name of your new release, The Wisdom of the Bullfrog. Would you remind our listeners and viewers what it means to be a bullfrog as a Navy SEAL? And we'll talk about the book in just a moment. Yeah, well, well <laughs> thanks. So the, the bullfrog is the title given uh, to the longest serving Navy SEAL on active duty. So when I got to uh, 33 years on active duty, uh, Admiral Eric Olson, who had been the bullfrog before me, handed it off to me and, and one of my very good friends. Uh, we shared it for about a year, Commander Brian Siebenhaller, and then he retired. So I held the title of bullfrog for the remaining two years of my, my career. And the point of the book is it's all of these lessons in leadership that I learned from 37 years of, of being a Navy SEAL. And, and of course, it, it, there's a little bit of pretentiousness, I guess, in the title because you know, nobody gets wise uh, unless you've been through a lot of uh, down, downsides. You, know, you have to deal with the challenges. You have to fail occasionally. You got to pick yourself up. Uh, wisdom comes uh, generally uh, you know, through hard measures. And so I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and, and I think every leader that gets to a point in their career where they're recognized as a leader went through and struggled and had mistakes and learned from those mistakes so I'm hoping that uh, that the hard lessons I learned can be of value to uh, you know some young leader or older leaders as they're they're making their way through their leadership challenges. Admiral, your books are are quite practical. They're small. They're they're easy to read. They're you know they're governing principles, as Voltaire said. Common knowledge isn't always common practice. And our co-founder, Dr. Covey, would say, "To know but not to do is not to know." You know, as we begin to start to enter the next round of elections in our country, I love this page on 11. I'm going to read it to you and our listeners as well. You basically say, this is what sets great leaders apart above the commonplace. It's simple. One, be fair and honorable in your business dealings. It's the only way that you and your employees can leave a legacy to be proud of. Number two, never lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those who do. The culture of your organization starts with you. Third, own your lapses in judgment. It happens to everyone. Correct the problem and return to being a person of good character. When you think about leaders, whether it is the CEO of a large company, the president of the United States, or a county commissioner, or someone that has an upstart organization, I'd like you to reiterate how important it is to have good character, to not lie, to not steal, to not cheat, to not name call, to not become a petty person. Because I think in the last five or six years, there has been a new standard set. Oh, wait, there's no standard. The standard now appears to be find someone's last name and rhyme it with something disparaging. And now that is your political position. I just, what has happened to our society where we choose to follow leaders? Or, or better yet, we defend them. We say, well, I don't like the person, but I like the policies. Or, I, don't, I don't understand how has that become the standard in our country, the greatest country in the history of the world, the country that quite frankly keeps the world stable and safe. What's happened to America that we have lowered our standard to the, the flash, the, 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 the charm, and the devolving conversation that is the opposite of what you say is leadership. Yeah, you know, it, it was the first chapter in the book, uh, as you know, Scott, uh, at least on the first lesson. And the reason I made it the first lesson is because what I've learned in, in really 40 years uh, of leading uh, remarkable men and women uh, is that if you are not a leader of character sooner or later, you and your organization will pay the price. Maybe not immediately. Uh, and, you know, we can all think of examples of, you know, universities that were on their way to a national championship, uh, but uh, all of a sudden they're, uh, they have a recruiting scandal or a, a company uh, like an Enron or, you know, pick some 
you know, major financial firm that collapsed because bad things were happening. And there is always this tendency to think that I can get away with it for a while. And maybe an organization can for a while, and, uh, but, but, but they can't forever. And sooner or later, if you build an organization on all the sorts of things you just listed, uh, if, if you are not fair in your dealings, uh, if you are not honest, if you are not men and women of integrity, and sooner or later that organization is just a house of cards and it will collapse. And unfortunately, when it collapses, it will take a lot of people with it. So to your point about you know, where we are as a nation, I had a discussion uh, with a, a student organization this week. And the final question came from one of the students and he asked me, he said, well, you know, what can we do uh, in, in our education system to, to change the course of the, the direction of the country in terms of the pettiness and the coarseness that you see happening? And I said, look, at the end of the day, we've got to teach civil discourse. Uh, we've got to make sure at a very young age, because frankly, if you think about it, if you have young kids, you know, when they're in, you know, pre-K and, you know, Johnny gets in, into a fight with Billy, the, you know, the kindergarten teacher comes out and says, now you boys stop, shake hands, be nice to each other. And we need to continue to reinforce that as we go through K through 12 and we get into you know, college, we need to reinforce why civil discourse is so important. And it's not just about being nice. It is about setting a standard for a society that understands that we're going to have different opinions. Uh, and it's okay to have different opinions. It's okay to agree to disagree. But that doesn't mean you have to be mean spirited. That doesn't mean you have to be coarse. That doesn't mean you have to be petty. Because if you do that, and you continue to instill that in the society, then before long, the society is not admired by people either within the society or the rest of the world. And, you know, you know I, I, I'm always careful about saying we're at the worst point in time we've been at in, you know, in America in the last, you know, almost 250 years. I don't believe that to be true at all. I grew up in the 60s when, you know, John F. Kennedy was shot, Bobby Kennedy was shot, Martin Luther King was shot. We had four students at Kent State that were killed. We had, you know, uh, Vietnam riots and, and civil, um, you know, civil rights marches and riots. Um, so I, I think, you know, we, we've got to be, be careful about where we put it in historical context, but that doesn't dismiss the fact that we are clearly, you know, on a downward trend right now when it comes to civil discourse, when it comes to having just a, you know, a, a conversation between people that can disagree and yet move the country forward. And I think that's what we've got to work hard to try to do. Our co-founder was a man, of course, named Dr. Stephen R. Covey. He was the author of the seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This book has gone on to now pollinate the world and make Franklin Covey the most trusted leadership firm globally. His eldest son, by the same name, is a man named Stephen M. R. Covey. He wrote also a seminal book called The Speed of Trust has now become one of our best-selling leadership offerings. And recently, he released a new book called Trust and Inspire. And the premise of this book, who I interviewed recently in this podcast, Stephen M. R. Covey, is that leaders go first. That the most important job of a leader is to model all the behaviors that you want to see in your team members. And that is, you don't want them to gossip, you cannot gossip. If you want them on time, you need to be on time. If you want them to be transparent and vulnerable and trustworthy, you have to model all those things. It's why not everyone should be a leader, because modeling everything you want to see in your people is a paramount responsibility. It reminds me of this contribution you make in the book. You say, one, be humble in your demeanor and your expectations. Accept the fact that you will be asked to do jobs that are beneath your status. Do them to the best of your ability. And then finally, you say, measure the strength of your employees by their willingness to do the little tasks and do them well. Why is that important enough to have made it in a central piece in your book, to recognize that you should be measuring your employees on their ability to, quite frankly, do a job that might be neat, their pay grade or their title or their competence or their, even their ego? Yeah, I, I put it in the book, uh, Scott, because it was one of the first lessons I learned as a Navy SEAL. I had just gotten to my, my first team and, and of course, I've come out of SEAL training, and I think sooner or later, they're going to send me on some secret mission to save the world. And, and I get called into the commanding officer's uh, office, 
He was a, a Navy 05, a Vietnam era SEAL. And I'm a young Navy ensign. I'm probably 22 years old. And I come into his office and, and, uh, and he tells me, look, I've been hearing good things about you. You know, the, the chief petty officers think you're doing well. You're one of my better ensigns. Of course, I'm just full of myself right now thinking, oh, this is great. The commanding officer knows who I am. And he says, I've got something very important that I need you to do. And I'm thinking to myself, well, here it comes. This is the, the mission I've been waiting for. And he says, you know, next month, we've got the 4th of July parade coming up in the city of Coronado. And I need you to build the frog float for the parade. And of course, I'm, I'm kind of stunned. I'm, at first, I'm not sure I understood what he said. Uh, and I'm like, a frog float? Yeah, I need you to build a frog float. You know, Freddy the Frog, and we'll put the space capsule on it. And, and of course, uh, I said, yes, sir. But as I walk out of, of his office, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, I came here to, you know, be a battle-hardened Navy SEAL, to go off and do SEAL missions, and now he has asked me to build a frog float. Well, I go into my locker room, uh, and I'm, I'm changing clothes because i just come off a, uh, a, a, an evolution in the bay, and I'm mumbling to myself, and this, this crusty old master chief is there, and, and he hears me mumbling, and he says, Ensign, what's wrong? I said, ah, nothing, Master Chief. He goes, come on, what's wrong? And so I told him the story. I said, well, you know, the commanding officer wants me to build a frog float. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, then you ought to build the best damn frog float you can. And to me, that was a lesson I needed to hear. Look, you know, you're going to go through your career. And I, I, as I say in the book, I've built a lot of frog floats in my career. And it's like, hey, you need me to wash windows? I'll wash windows. You need me to make coffee? I'll make coffee. You tell me what you need me to do in order to make the organization better, and that's what I'll do. And the reason I tell the readers that is because I've found in my time that those individuals that are willing to do those things that somehow seem beneath them in the best interest of the organization, those are the people that I will later hire to do the big jobs because they have paid their dues, they understand the importance of doing the little things well, and, and they're the ones that I really want to see later on in positions of leadership. Admiral, your current book is called The Wisdom of the Bullfrog, Leadership Made Simple But Not Easy. And you have carefully curated a series of quotes. By the way, I love the one from uh, Oprah Winfrey. Lots of people want to ride with you in the limo. But what you want is someone who will take the bus with you when the limo breaks down. I'm sure there are some great stories behind why you included that quote. But here's one from George Washington Carver. I'd like to have you expand upon it. And then after that, I'm going to ask you to talk about that picture that's behind you over the billiards table. 99% um, of all failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. Maybe you could bring some gravitas to the crescendo of this conversation. Talk about why this quote, 99% of all failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. Well, it, you know, it's, it's been fairly self-evident in, in my career, uh, particularly with leaders, is that, you know, when things go south, uh, if this is the man or woman that goes, oh, well, you know, we had this problem, but here's why. Well, no, you were the leader. You should have thought about that problem. Uh, and, and you find those that are kind of constantly finding reasons for their failures. Uh, again, we all fail. You know, we all, we all fail. There are always external forces that, that come into it. You know, I think I've got another quote in there about no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Of course, you can build the best plan in the world and things are going to go south. But if it does go south, then you better have plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. Your job as a leader is to think through those things that could cause you uh, to fail. But if you do fail, then your job as a leader is to say, you know what, it's on me. Because as the leader, there was something I didn't see, somebody I didn't train, somebody I didn't educate, somebody I didn't give the resources to. Somehow the plan was flawed because at the end of the day, uh, as the leader, it's your responsibility. And so... The good leaders understand that. Now, you know, I have seen young junior officers who, when things go south, the first thing they want to do is go, well, you know, it's, you know, and they're worried about their career and their work, and they, they forget that the senior leaders have probably been in their position before. Even as a young junior officer, the best junior officer that I saw were the men or the women that said, 
hey, uh, things didn't go well. It's on me. I'll fix it and I'll be better next time. And I think that's what leaders have to do. I'm guessing you are aware of and have read your SEAL colleagues, Jocko and Will and um, Leif's books, Extreme Ownership and Extreme Leadership. I mean, phenomenal books about taking ownership. I thought to the extent those stories uh, reflect your own experience, their vulnerability and sharing when they actually fell down on the job. Most of their, I think it was extreme ownership was about a lot of their time in Iraq and Fallujah and others and instances where uh, they had some very serious issues that were actually their responsibility. They actually took responsibility for it and it's had a phenomenal impact on me. Highly recommend the books on um, extreme ownership and extreme leadership. Uh, tell me about the picture behind you between the bookcase and the billiard table. I can make out part of it. What would you share about why that's on your wall and what would you like maybe the world to know about the, the mission behind that mission and uh, what happened during the mission? What would you share with us that would be intriguing? Yeah, so obviously it's a picture of bin Laden and it's actually from the military magazine, The Stars and Stripes, the, the daily newspaper that comes out. Uh, and what you probably can't see on there, it was, it was presented to me by uh, one of my very, very uh, good friends and, and general officers, uh, General Tony Thomas. Uh, and so part of it was the fact that, uh, and, and he's got a very nice quote on it, um, you know, the, the, the thing that a leader wants more than anything else is to be respected by the men and women that he serves or she serves. And, uh, and I have the utmost respect for General Thomas. And so to me, it was a, a special uh, memento. But the, I guess the point that I would leave you on the bin Laden raid is, uh, you know, the SEALs uh, get a lot of credit for this, uh, as they should. I'm very proud of the guys that went in and the helicopter pilots uh, uh, that, that brought us in there. Uh, but we should never forget that, you know, we were a very small part of a, an incredible organization. You know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, civilians, uh, that fought in Iraq, that fought in Afghanistan, uh, you know, trying to keep Al Qaeda and others from attacking the United States again. You know, I'm often asked about uh, uh, after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, you know, was this all worth it? Yeah, I, I mean, the history books will make that determination, but we haven't had an attack on the United States since 9-11. Um, and I often think about the number of Iraqis and Afghans that were saved uh, by U.S. troops it's really a credit to the entire United States and our allies that kind of helped in, uh, in, in keeping Al Qaeda at bay and ISIS and, and, uh, and others. So um, we were a very, very, you know, uh, kind of small part of the bigger picture, humbled and honored to be the guys that, that got bin Laden, uh, but never forget those that sacrificed so much after 9 11. Beautifully said, sir. I'm aware our time is ending. It is precious with you. Uh, we're taping this interview at the end of March. That is releasing right as your book, uh, The Wisdom of the Bullfrog, is coming out. A lot going on in the world. A lot going on in North Korea, China and Taiwan, China and Russia. A lot going on in the Middle East. The alliances between uh, uh, China brokering deals with Iran and Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's a lot going on with Russia and Ukraine. Is there a particular area that you think is m the most uh, concerning that the average citizen, the average global citizen should be aware of, they should be educated about, be attuned to, be talking to their legislator about, be voting for candidates. Is there a particular, there's a lot going on right now. I, I know, like, like you, I've been um, watching this for 50 plus years. Anything in particular that without causing, causing hysteria to say, you know what, of all the things going on, this one or two thing needs to have everybody paying attention to. Yeah, as you point out, Scott, there is a lot going on. And, uh, and the good news is I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time uh, and manage a number of these, uh, these kind of global crises uh, as, uh, as they're kind of affecting not just us, obviously, but our, our allies in the world. The, the issue in Russia and Ukraine, and it's going to get harder as it goes on, uh, I really do believe it's, it's a bit of an existential fight uh, in terms of American and Western leadership for the next 50 years. So if Russia succeeds in Ukraine, and if they quote unquote win, whatever winning might look like, and if you think about winning from Putin's standpoint, right about now, I think he would be happy just to take the Donbass and build that land bridge down to Crimea. 
Um, and, and that is why he is continuing to recruit, you know, more uh, more young Russians to come fight. You know, 300,000 last year, another 500,000 uh, have been called up, I think, this year. Uh, but we have to hold the line and we have to help the Ukrainians continue to push the Russians back. We have to help the Ukrainians win this fight, because if Russia wins, then you will begin to see a lot of the world question whether or not it is worth following the United States, whether or not U.S. leadership will be as strong. Did the United States come and help uh, Ukraine when the Ukrainians really needed it? And will we be there for our other allies? So it is about making sure that we continue to support those countries that are democratic, as messy as democracy is. And it is messy. And democracies make a lot of mistakes. And we've seen it over the last you know, several decades. But it's still the best form of government out there. The United States is by far and away still the finest country in the world. Nobody even close. Would, we, would you want to live under China? Would you want to live under Russia? Would you want to live anywhere else rather than here? I don't think so. I think most people would say this is where we need to be. Well, also our ability to influence the world, the world's economy, uh, the world's security, uh, the world's health, all of this is a function of, in my opinion, how well the war in Ukraine goes and whether or not the world continues to believe uh, th that America is the right leadership to follow. Uh, so we need to keep an eye on that. Um, and, and the war is going to drag on. This is going to be long. It's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. And, and we just can't lose our resolve. And I think we need to stand by those in Congress uh, that continue to support our efforts to supply the Ukrainians with lethal aid to help them win this fight. Admiral, final question. It's nonpartisan, non-denominational, non-anything. Uh, I, I might say that, you know, other than the Cuban Missile Crisis, we're at perhaps one of the most dangerous times we lived in our, in my generation. Right. And I think it's been, you know, how many decades has it been since the president of the United States had serious military experience? I think it's been decades. I, I can't think of one Eisenhower, perhaps the last one. Was there one? Was has there been someone with senior military? Is it time? Is it time for the United States electorate to think seriously without being a warmonger, without understanding that diplomacy and negotiation and civility is the best policy? Is it time for the U.S. to elect a military leader to make sure that we keep our position as the model, the standard? We make mistakes. We've had issues, we've screwed things up, we fix things. Is it time for that? Yeah, I think it is time, as it is always time, to elect the best leader for the United States. And a little bit back to the dialogue we were having a few minutes ago. You know, you want to put somebody in the Oval Office that represents the best qualities of the United States, uh, that you know, it is above the fray where they have to be, that has a strategic mind, that has the energy uh, and can inspire the men and women of the United States and the world. Uh, so I don't necessarily think you're looking for a military guy. Uh, you don't have to have military experience. Again, I work uh, for both President Bush and President Obama. Uh, President Bush obviously had some time in the, in the Air Force uh, and the Air Force Reserve. President Obama had none. But I will tell you, they were both good leaders in their own rights. Um, and so you don't have to have that military experience, but whoever we elect, we need to make sure that they represent the best of what this country represents. And, um, and, and I hope we can find that candidate, uh, you know, next time around. Nice pivot, sir. Admiral William McRaven, what an honor to have you on our podcast today. Thank you. Thank your wife on behalf of us as well for her service to our nation. Your new book is called The Wisdom of the Bullfrog, Leadership Made Simple but Not Easy. Sir, you are a class act. Thank you for your time today. My pleasure, Scott. Thank you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. <laughs>